Welcome to this late night broadcast of the War Room. I'd like to welcome all the late nighters, all the night owls, the night watchmen, night watch ladies, all the people who are up late at night contemplating what's going on in this world, all the people who are up late at night trying to figure out how to solve the issues that we need to solve and make this world better. And that's the reason why I'm having to show this late at night and I'm starting it off. There was a first rendition of the show and this is the second rendition. I haven't aired it in a while. And even though there might be three of you or whatnot or five or 30 or a hundred, this show is gonna be very important for everyone to watch. My name is John Lancelot. Real progressives, and we're going to be talking about foreign policy. Now, I call this a war room because um, obviously none of us here wants war. We don't want war. Um, but war is a reality, and as progressives, as anti war, you know, we are people that don't really want to see more war. We have to understand where it's coming from. We have to understand that we have the responsibility to look at foreign policy and what's going on in our world in a very realistic way. Hi, Karen. We have to understand that what we're talking about is a new direction for U.S. foreign policy. U.S. foreign policy has gone a long way. U.S. foreign policy has gone through years and years since the beginning of the Republic of evolution. But we have to understand that in the beginning of the Republic, that foreign policy affected domestic policy. It's not something that you could separate. It's something that you have to consider. And I feel that progressives have overlooked this reality for a very long time. And reason, because we've been dependent on the Democrats to deliver peace agreements, disarmament agreements, we'd say with nuclear weapons and Russia, you know, scaling down conflict. And it's a tough issue because we have to look at it. We have been involved with proxy wars. In the last century, the 20th century, we had two major world wars. We had Vietnam, Korean War. I'm not necessarily laying it out in order. The Spanish-American War. We had Grenada in the 80s. We had the Gulf Wars, two Gulf Wars. We had Kosovo. And we had Iran-Contra. And you just name it. We could just name the conflicts over and over and over. So as progressives, we're involved in this movement. We're involved in trying to change the United States of America to a country that not only cares for the people in this country, but also cares for our brothers and sisters abroad. So we have to take this very seriously. Just saying that we're any war and we don't want any more war is not enough. We have to dig deep. And here at Real Progressives, we love talking about economy. Economy is basically our bedrock here because that is where policy starts. That is the beginning of policy making. And we're going to learn tonight how modern monetary theory also could revolutionize our US foreign policy. And really um, it's not being talked about anywhere else. If you look to any other portion of the movement, it's not being spoken about. Of course, I like to give a little leeway to organizations that are trying to organize and, you know, create coalitions and go into communities. Some even, you know, feed the homeless. Um, you know, they talk about uh, issues of race and gender and sexual orientation and all that. It's very, very important for us to talk about. But the one thing that is overlooked over and over again is economics. Economics affects everything. And in order to understand 
how we can affect what's going on abroad and how we affect what's going on here, we have to understand how Congress works and how Congress has the power. Congress can never go broke. All right, I'm just gonna go down the list. Social Security cannot go broke. We need a federal jobs guarantee. We could afford that. We could afford a health care healthcare for all. And it could be done in the next 15 days. If Congress had the will to do it, they could issue that by keystrokes. All this talk about inflation and printing money. When's the last time you used cash? Right now we're using credit cards and we're doing it through our devices. We're taking the economy on. We don't really need paper money, right? But it's there. It's in the economy. But what the issue is, is that we don't have enough circulation here at home and abroad because we we buy our imports from other countries and we have nothing to export. And both parties are guilty of this. We have to realize as progressives, we've been supporting the Democratic Party for years. And it just seems that the people who are running for office and the people that are in office don't understand economics. And it's true. We say it, we say it here all economics. Yes, in 15 days, if Congress had the will to pass a to rebuild the infrastructure that have a federal jobs guarantee, it could be done. MNT is not, not something that we have to implement. It's a reality in the U.S. Constitution. Congress has the uh, power to issue currency. Congress has the power of the purse. It could go into a deficit and a bank for Congress saying, well, you're in debt, we're going to put you into insolvency. We're going to put you, in, and we're going to put you on a structured plan. Not, not, that's not what we're lucky to have a legislature that sort of power. But the way that con and all the congressional leadership likes to talk about is that we, we, you know, we have a debt and we have to pay it up. Just like you know, you know, you have your own debts. You live in the household to pay it up. Our federal government is not run like a household. Federal government is a sovereign entity. And they issue the currency. They are the monopolizer of the currency. Banks and rich people do not issue currency. It's done by the government. The Congress is our institution, our institution, the people. So I'm going to read um, the early in the and frauds of economic policy by Warren Mosler. I think that is the beginning of this because we, we have to remember that we want to change policy. One thing is protesting, and that's very, right? Going out and protesting is, is a pro, it's, it's, it's a good thing to do, but you need more than all. All the big protests that I've been involved with and organized for, um, there's only one aspect because then that energy disappears and it's gone. It doesn't lead to anything. It's just we showed up in force and it's gone. It, whether anti war. So when we pay attention to the uh, economy, we are basically crafting a new policy we are new direction and that's something that that's something that we've been very weak in over the years but that changes uh this year and so, so when we go over warren mosler's seven deadly innocent frauds of the i'm going to tell you what that leads into and i guess the audio is breaking up and i'm sorry about that i'm because it's late, and, but bear with me. The first one is the government must raise funds through taxation or borrowing in order to spend. In other words, limited by its ability to tax or borrow. So I'd be the issue. I'm going to um, 
Is there someone tell me? Can you hear me? Is it still cutting? I'm not sure now, but uh, just keep telling me whether you're hearing me or not. I'm going to keep on going and then cutting. Okay, that's hilarious. Maybe because it's late, it's cutting out. Okay. So maybe that tells me that doing a late night show is not good. It will be okay. Breaking up a little bit. I get it. Very, um, how, how bad is it? How bad is like a CD skipping? That's interesting. Usually it's very smooth. Hello. Hello, everyone. You can hear me. Okay. Fine. Um, thank you very much. All right, so this is what we're going to go. We're going to go over the seven um, deadly innocent frauds that they. Um, with government deficits, we are leaving in the burden of. Did you hear that? So the government keeps telling us that we're going to leave our. Do you believe that? Because that's a lie. That's a lie. Government budgets, those deficits, take away savings. Social security, have you heard that one before? Okay. We need savings to provide funding for investment. Did you hear that? Okay. It's a bad thing that higher deficits today mean higher taxes tomorrow. Great, it's a great book. These are the things that they tell us all the time, and I hope it gets better. I hope the signal gets better. Because what I'm going to talk to you about is the Washington Consent, liberalism, and that's what it brought. We go to other countries and put them into these binds. We've done it in the Caribbean, we've done it in South America mainly in developing countries. And so the Washington consensus is basically neoliberalism. I'm gonna explain how it destabilizes regions. Where after the Iraq, and, and I'm talking about the Iraq invasion of uh, 2003, 2000, no, 2001, the Iraq war, and it went on to, 2003, and then Charles Bremer landed in there. And they issued, they started doing exactly what is the um, Washington consensus and neoliberalism. What they did is that a fiscal policy discipline with avoidance of large fiscal. Sounds familiar? So they go to other countries and we, they say, look, you know, you're in debt to us. We're going to reduce. And I see the latency in, in everything. I see the latency. It's probably because it's late. Same thing to us right now that other countries abroad. So this same economic practice has been ha happening and it's happening to us now. Form broadening and moderate marginal tax rates, competitive exchange rates, trade liberalization. So that means of imports, with particular emphasis on elimination of quantitative. Any trade protections will be eliminated. So, privatization of state enterprises. The same thing in Iraq. 
certain seg- services, they did the same thing. Neoliberalism is something that's been happening since the early 70s. And the first time they implemented neoliberalism was in Chile after Pinochet took that country over. And they automatically elected that country, the Allende. And they implemented the, the Washington was done by, by the Chicago boys because Milton Friedman was a University of Chicago professor. This is the same university. I'm not saying it's linkage. It's just funny how it is. So they went to Chile, you know, all the followers of Milton Friedman, and they crafted policies. Basically, this dictator named Pinochet brought them into his fold and they crafted economic policies and they privatized everything that was going public. You know, healthcare, you name it. Just like what they're trying to do here. So when you see the Republicans trying to damage our healthcare system by passing horrendous bills, that's the Washington consensus. That's neoliberalism. They're doing it right here. Exactly. He was a butcher, right? And that's how neoliberalism started. Let that sink in for a second. We have people who are elected in our government of both parties who cater to an economic philosophy that was implemented by a brutal dictator. Pinochet. It was implemented in England by Margaret Thatcher. She was a champion of neoliberalism. Reagan was a champion of neoliberalism. It's something relatively new in history. And now it dominates not only our domestic politics, it's new, but they've been trying to chip away at us since the 80s. And now we're in danger of losing services. They want to privatize everything. They even want to privatize, uh, you know, the fixing of roads and infrastructure, which we know companies do not, are not built to do that. Hey, Lawrence. So we have to look at what's going on here and everything that we don't like what's going on here and um, transpose it to what's going on abroad. When we invaded Iraq, I'm just reiterating, they implemented new liberalism immediately. Um, Paul Bremer, who was appointed by Bush, went as pretty much the chief of the whole area and implemented these same policies. All right? And I could read to you what they did. Full privatization of public enterprises, full ownership rights by foreign firms in Iraqi business. So they basically took over Iraqi businesses. Um, they took over the banks. I mean, they take. I don't even have to. They took everything over. All right. That destabilized that alone. So people tend to believe that the initial attack, the initial invasion, uh, uh, destabilized Iraq. And there's a lot of argument that we could have on the validity of when the whole region started to crumble. But as soon as they started implementing this this destructive economic policy called neoliberalism, it started to destabilize the region. Till this day is destabilized. And now we're dealing with a region with a vacuum. We're dealing with Syria. And we have to realize that economics, and and we say this there, and, and, and you hear Steve say it all the time, this is murder by proxy, right? So we come in with our, um, you know, our tanks and our planes and whatnot. We decimate the area. We get rid of the old leader, Saddam Hussein. We got rid of him. We attempt to stabilize the region. Of course, people are um, in shock after invasion. And then they implement neoliberalism, which has been implemented over and over again through the history since 1970s, and it has been a disaster every 
single time. So you tell me, how do you plan on stopping war if you don't understand how MMT, right, for us is a priority for our policies so we can start bringing it abroad? We can start liberating countries, having them determine their own destiny. Because MMT is not just an American thing. This is a policy that's worldwide. And so we have to be very honest with ourselves on, on how we're going to proceed and craft policy that fits our agenda. Hey, Thomas. So basically, basically, we've been missing it this whole time. Now, when Bernie Sanders was running last, last year, right, we didn't hear a lot about what he planned to do in foreign policy. It was very, you know small um you know the you know the hillary campaign jumped down on it they tried to make hillary look all foreign policy all was like secretary of state and look all presidential which didn't matter at the end but um that's what they tried to position bernie doesn't know much about you know foreign policy and he has his pie in the sky economic plan for here and what we're talking about here when we're studying um modern monetary theory and we were talking about uh, a new direction of foreign policy. We're not talking about pie in the sky. We're talking about crafting real policies for candidates to run for congressional office and win to convince the American people that we have been going in the wrong directions for the past 40 to 50 years. This is, this is nothing. This is the easy part. All right. but. Um, this is something that we have to work hard at uh, uh, thinking about. Choose a country. At, at, let's choose North Korea. North Korea is hard. It's not easy. It's not an easy uh, country to deal with. But we have to understand what happened during the Korean War in order to figure out the issues. I don't think Trump even knows what happened yesterday. I, I, you know, uh, he's not going to go back. Usually a president should have a good understanding of history so it informs the current decisions. It's like when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. I'm sure the Kennedy administration had to figure out what has been going on in Cuba for them to embrace Khrushchev. Or wh wh what did we do to Khrushchev for them to all of a sudden, you know, triangulate with Castro? Right. So that's diplomacy right there. But I, I, I see a lot of people saying, you know what, uh, you know, I yeah, I'm anti war. You know, I'm against war. You know, I don't like what's going on abroad. Great. That's awesome. Do you know what's what's been going on? Well, you know, we've been, you know, dropping bombs on Iraq. We've uh, you know, we've been dropping bombs on, on Afghanistan. Uh, you know, it's wrong. You know, now we're in Syria and that's a mess. That that's a mess. You couldn't make a chessboard more messy than that. I mean, you need more squares and pieces. Um, and you know, uh, but it's more than that. It all boils down to economics. What has happened in this region of the world in the past twenty years? What has been going on in the past thirty years? What sort of economic policies has this region of the world been subjected to? And what happens when you implement neoliberalism in a state, the Washington consensus in a state where you have the IMF and World Bank coming in, swooping in, jacking the resources and, and not returning anything because they owe money. And then their currency drops tremendously. The people um, basically have to dump their resources because the imports are underpriced. Let's take milk, for instance. Just use milk. If you have a country where they've been exporting milk and that's how they've been making a good portion of their economy because they, you know, they have, you know, the resources. They've had the resources for, let's say, the past hundred years to, um, you know, they have the, the fields and everything with cows uh, to, you know, ship the best milk around the world. Suddenly the government gets into a problem. They fall into a bind with the IMF or World Bank. They put them onto a structured 
policy agenda, which is the Washington Consensus, which are all these layers of um, policy directives that they have to follow. And one of the things is that foreign direct investment has to be a part of the plan, which means there is no way the government can block any company from shipping in milk that's cheaper. And when they export that milk, it's, it's, it's so expensive that it's not really being bought. So what, what, are, what is there left to do? Dump the milk, pretty much. Milk is going to spoil over a certain amount of time. You can't just keep it there. They're importing, and it gets to the point where they're importing powdered milk because it's cheaper, and the people in the country are too poor to buy actual milk, so they buy the cheap stuff. So the farmers who've been, for years, um, been making milk for not only for the country, for the rest of the world, they can't do anything with it. That's neoliberalism. That's gangster, right? That's gangster politics. That's gangster economy. You go into a country, you, you rip them out of the resources, and then you say, you owe us money. That That is a disaster. That is the root of destabilization. Because what if you live in a country like that and you can't feed your family? What if you're in a country like that and you can't you can't find a job? country like that and you're dealing with violence because people are hungry and people are getting robbed in the streets for money and the richest families in that country move out of that country because they it's getting too bad and then the poor people are left to live under this and the governments in these neoliberal situations are so corrupt the, the parties are so corrupt that when it comes to election time, there's violence in the streets. This is the reality. It happens in the Caribbean. It happens in, in South America. It's been happening. But if you go back to Pinochet, that was a violent takeover. And instead of being condemned, they go in with their economic policy. So that you know, there's a great question that was asked. How do you stop them? How how do you stop them? So we have a movement here. We have a movement, a progressive, a political revolution that's been going on. It's been building up slowly. So it didn't really start last year. It's been building up slowly. Um, I, I believe strong since the Iraq war started. And it's been building up. And the Democrats have always been attached to it. And we have been supporting Democrats. I've been a, uh, independent for a long time, but um, obviously, you know, I want to vote for the candidates that I felt that were progressive enough to get the job done. When they get in, they fall into these old patterns. So <laughs> take the most obvious one. Uh, Barack Obama, 2008. Wow, man, that was progressive, right? He came out and he was King Progressive. He came out, we supported him. We even beat the establishment candidate, Hillary Clinton. Amazing, right? We turned around and beat McCain, and we had ourselves not only the first African American president, which I think is just minor at this point, but we had a progressive president. And what did he end up being? The biggest neoliberal of all. Because he fell into the same pattern. Now, let's give, let's, let's give, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's give the benefit of the doubt, right? So he's a progressive. He had all these ideals. Let's say that he was being um, uh, genuine. Let's say he was being genuine. I, I want to stop these wars. You know, they even gave him a Nobel Peace Prize for the campaign or whatnot, and he just changed everything. He didn't have econo new economic policies in hand. There was no economist saying that we should implement this sovereign monetary theories in our policies. Just push the Congress towards here. There was no plan to change the foreign policy and defense structures. He basically just started doing the same thing with drones and. And Libya. It, it, the issue is, 
if we end up with a progressive in a major office, let's say in the Senate or in the House of Representatives or even the presidency, let's say Bernie would have won last year. Let's say we're in an alternate universe and Bernie would have gotten in. With Stephanie Kelton by his side, maybe, just maybe, he would have said, you know what, there's a sovereign monetary, we live in a sovereign monetary system and we're going to implement, we want Congress to start building up this Green New Deal, which we ultimately want. We ultimately want to craft policy so so we can get America back on track. We're not going to talk about inflation because that's not a factor. People need work. You're not going to get inflation if people are sitting around and need to work. You know, we, uh, you know, the people could bring America. I mean, reasonable plan. But, but okay, so that's on the domestic front. On the foreign, if Bernie would have gotten there, there's a chance, right? There's always a chance when you're the president of the United States that you're going to be influenced by the foreign policy symbol for you. This is a year in the making of policies and situations. So when you walk in, you can't really walk in and say, oh, you know what? I'm going to change this. I'm going to change this on the dots, right? Because I think a lot of people think, I'm going to get in. Hey, not. Well, you know, it's not just the Dems won't let they will never let him in, or you know, that, I mean, that's a good thing. That maybe the Dems will never let him do it. The Dems say, you know what? We're not going to let you change our foreign policy at all. We're not going to let you change it. They could do that to you if you don't have anything in hand. Same studies, papers. I have white papers. I have research saying that a that we could policy. We have done the research. We have three. Barack of that, he walked into a foreign policy establishment that was already established, and he walked in without a plan. To... I agree that we've had this issue with North Korea. I agree that we've had this issue with... from the last administration. I know we've had this issue with China. We want to, you know, try to agreement with China, a diplomatic agreement with Libya between and uh, um, We have issues with, um, you know, these different parts of the world. Uh, um, I know that we've dealt with this a certain way. We have the Joint Chiefs of Staff, so we have the National Security Council. The people that you've chosen might already have an idea because they were there or they were there in past administrations. So you have to really have uh, um, the wherewithal sitting around the table and say, well, you know what? When Kennedy was facing the Cuban Missile Crisis, and this was a crisis point because obviously the world kind of a real, we probably wouldn't be here right now, most of us. And, and sitting at that DEFCON, and uh, they were trying to push Kennedy, but when they knew they had missiles in there. Because they're going to try to get all those missiles out by airstrikes. You think Kennedy was like, "Yeah, right." You know, um, I'm not. I'm not going to. You know, I'm not going to go against you guys. Let's do it. Let's do that. He table. He got up from the table. He walked away. He came. He played. Let back channel, chef to alleviate the issue. That's not what the National Security Council wanted, at least at the people at the table, like Atchison and, and, and the rest of them. Since the Eisenhower administration, they were war hawks. War hawks only know one language. Bomb, 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 that's how we solve everything. Forget about the State Department. This is dangerous. If we don't get rid of this problem, we're gonna be dealing with this. We have to with us here domestically. That's what the Democrats are trying to draw progressives into. When you have Democrats, have to get rid of Trump. 
now. Forget about any any other solution. If you come with us, we will beat Trump. There's too much at, at stake. You know, basically, right now, there's too much at stake. No other party is going to work. I'm trying to reform the Democratic Party, which look, Bernie. But the thing is that we have to be adults here, and we have to question. There's is independent. He won uh, a Senate campaigns. He's been winning. Um as independent he's not really saying how he did it chooses to talk about how trump is dangerous when you put it into a foreign policy context when you have the joint you have the national security you the bomb only solution that we have because if we wait we could have a disaster on our hands as a step back and you know what i don't know if that's true we have to really think of it. So, um, you know, we, we as progressive policies that, know that we could deliver New Deal, that we could deliver anti-war policies that, that gets us out of these entanglements. And there's a lot of entanglements. It's not gonna be overnight. Look what, look what happened to um, uh, when we pulled out of Iraq, when Obama got us out of Iraq, and I'm not saying that was bad, but it created more an issue. It, and, uh, and it created the conditions for Syria to metastasize. So we have to look at and realize that we have to go in a new direction. And here a lot of that coming from aggressive leadership from Bernie. Um, there's a lot to understand on Trump and how terrible he is, which she is. Um, you know, the the Republicans are and, and they're running, they're just making a mess. Have you noticed the Congress is not talking about um, foreign policy other than ISIS? North Korea is the new big rage. Uh, but now they're trying to they're trying to to alter it, and they so long, long. Um, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So we have Republicans and 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 the Democrats lost it all. It lost every bit of it. Right, turn back to us and say. Because you guys didn't support us, we lost the election. Trying to just, you know, try to fear us, right? And and we're adults, right? We've been involved in the movement for a while. Here in New Jersey, it's the same thing, except it's really corrupt. State country is corrupt. States, I don't care if in running any state seat. You cannot deliver on Congress and say, you know what, you better do your job. I'm governor running for uh, the legislature in your state. I don't catch you. If you're a progressive, you won't be able to deliver. Taxes are going to go up because the states are broke. You won't be able to deliver. So I, I don't believe candidates are really going to be doing much. Because they're going to say what you they're going to say what you, you want to hear. Good, and they're going to whisper these sweet nothings in your ear. But when it comes down to it, they're either they can't win, and a Republican gets in, which is usually true. An independent doesn't win. The Democrat wins. They can't deliver. Even if they're in the majority, they can't deliver. Just look at the hatches like just an attack which should have had a public option when they had the full Congress, but that's a nut cast. And over and over again, is the of our country and is linked to what it is here domestically and is linked to what's going on abroad. And so all of this, you know, they're talking about uh, we can't, and Congress is, is broke and, you know, the deficit is bad. 
when the government is in a deficit, private surpluses exist. When the government is balanced, the plus there's no private industry is basically or private individuals as well are not going to be doing very well. And when the government has then um, private companies and individuals are in the that's 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 not so it's bad for you to be in a deficit. It's bad. Congress cannot go bankrupt. It's a very specific reason why that way. Now in England, when they, you know, they have their own election, right? Because basically the prime minister called for a new election. Parliament's in the same position as Congress, but they're doing, we can't afford the NHS. We can't afford your healthcare here. Basically they want, to turn Britain's and people are buying it. So there, there's there's a lot of things going on here that we can't uh, we can't allow to happen. So how do we fix it? We fix it by understanding economics. We 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 are to fix the country. We need members of Congress that know what they're doing and not just there to win re-election and basically do nothing. Because that's our Congress. Most, I'm not going to say every, Congress. Majority. And they need to be shoved out. They need to, we need to figure out what we're going to do, how we're going to move forward. A lot of us don't want to deal with a lot of us don't want to deal with that, but I understand that the party is there. There's a structure. Those were the Democratic Party that have been shoved out. It's the power to progressives. So there's nothing easy about the way out. If we have to make a people's party, that's what we have. Because we have to go into red districts to win those seats so we get the House back. We have. I mean, we, we know the Democrats don't want to go in the end, but we know independents who they can explain it to the American people. That's, that's a, the American people need a relief. They need, we all need it. So, my recommendation for and I'm glad everyone thanks for sitting through the this signal. We're gonna go over this again. The way that we're going to get the, this country back is that we hold the people who are running for office to a questions and we say, You deliver your promises. Forget about the Republicans and the right wing. They've gone towards auto destruction. They're not with us. American people, the American people, the majority of them have their back. Let them then an economic plan to get started. And uh, this is what we have to do about before. We have to put a lot of study to our history, a lot of history, and we have to know the history of the world, and we have to reach out to people who are suffering and say that we're good for you. We're not going to resort to um, platitudes or you know fraudulent economic policies to make you feel good, we're going to tell you how exactly we're going to do it. We're going to get a majority in Congress. Hopefully one day we can have a majority and we can get the Green New Deal that we want. Then that's what we want. I don't know anyone that doesn't want that. I even speaking spoken to people that, who are um, conservative and they're disenchanted 
with the Republican Party, just like we're disenchanted with the. But there's just an mindlessness. I got to vote for one of the two parties, the lesser. No, they're too evil for you. And if you have children, earned because they're not going to have much of your future. And that's what we were for the children of America. We want a life. And we want to where we're not causing issues. We're really doing it on purpose. You know, some of us might do it on purpose um, who, are, who have power. But we just have to be brave enough to say, you know what? We're going in the wrong this is what we're going to do. With this is how we're going to deal with China since we're in an economic arrangement with them. This is the way that we're going to broker a peace deal between India and Pakistan. This is the way that we're going to deal with Afghanistan and understand the region once and for all. This is how we're going to try to give back to Iraq and try to rebuild their country and help them do it. This is the way that we're going to deal with Libya and try to alleviate the suffering there. This is the way that we're going to deal with the Palestinian-Israel issue uh, that's been raging on for so long. This is this is the new way we're going to do it. This is the way that we're going to deal and make sure that South America could determine their own destiny. This is the way that we're going to deal with the Caribbean and how they're going to, you know, basically determine their own destiny. This is the way that we're going to uh, 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 fish out that brutal dictator in the Philippines. And we don't have to drop one bomb to do it. Because this is the kind of world that we're trying to make. We want a future. We want to rebuild America. We want a future. We want, um, you know, you know, federal jobs guarantee. We want to rebuild the infrastructure that people are not getting poisoned by, by lead water. We want to make sure our Native American brothers and sisters' lands are not being encroached on. We want to make sure that uh, Americans are being educated properly with real uh, um, education, not the horrible education that we've all been receiving. Because a good education informs a democracy. It, 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 you can't have a, a working democracy without educated population. So these are all the challenges that we face. And of course, we have to change it one at a time. And the way that we do that is that we speak to people and we let them know what we believe and we let them know that this is how we're going to do it. If somebody's been working for a company for a long time and they want to go off in their own venture, modern monetary theory has an answer for that. You can open that small business your state will be able to supplement that. The banks will be able to loan you the money to go into your own business so you can hire people and make jobs and the cycle continues. We can rebuild our infrastructure. We don't have to be at war all the time. We can have a space policy that supplements all the, all the, all the science that's being done. And so the, the space program wouldn't go away. It would just be better. We want innovation. We want a 21st century that is a 21st century. We don't want to drag the 20th century anymore behind us. We want to leave the burdens of the two world wars behind us. We want a new world to live in. We want a world that we could all be proud of. We want a world that we can leave behind for the future generations of human beings where they can go off into the stars and come back home to a world where there is no war. Because as a human race, we have matured. And the only way we're going to do it is that we do the hard work right now. And I believe that as progressives, we are bringing the future here. And we have to hang together and get past the division and get past the Democratic Party and the Republican Party 
and then we have to form a people's party and join Cornell West and join all the others and join Nick Brenna and join Stephen Grumbine. We join Joe Firestone and all the other economists, Stephanie Kelton. And we make the world the way we want it. So I hope everyone has a good night tonight. There's a lot to think about. And thank you for staying up late with me because I'm up late all the time. And, oh yeah, Progressive Independence Party. Yes, yes, Progressive Independence Party. And um, I really, really feel hopeful that we are going to be able to turn this world around. So John Lancelot signing off for the rest of the night. You have sweet dreams and dream of a world that's peaceful. Bye-bye.